Welcome. This is a talk called Learning How to Ride, and it is an introduction to Psycho.js, which is a very, ni very nice framework. So, show of hands, how many of you have heard about Psycho.js before? Oh, OK, it's a bit better than I expected. Nice, nice, nice. So it's a framework. It's similar to, for example, frameworks like you would expect, like Angular or React or those kind of things, which I'm hoping you're going to be familiar with. But it's different in many ways as well. So we're going to go over some of those differences. So brief index, introduction to how it looks, what the code looks like. Then because functional and reactive programming are a huge part of Psycho.js. I'm going to spend the bulk of the presentation going over the um, reactive concepts that you will need in Psycho.js, especially a framework called RxJS, which is quite cool. And it's like the building blocks of Psycho. Um, and then I'm going to go over the good, the bad, and the beautiful of Psycho.js. Um, I'm not here to preach you to start using it and leave all other things behind. I myself have been using React for quite a while now, and I love it. I love this as well. So it's just getting you guys, giving you guys a test, taste of what it is, and hopefully encourage you to try it out, because it's quite cool. Um, so what is it? What does it look like? Why should you care? So in the words of the creator called Andre Staltz. Um, Psycho.js is a functional and reactive JavaScript framework for cleaner code. Cleaner code being the keyword there. It, it removes everything that you don't need. Um, it's functional and reactive, simple, concise, extensible, very testable, which is a good thing for those of you who want to do unit testing, which you all should be doing, by the way. Um, explicit data flow, so like you can trace how the items are coming into the application and out of it. Composable, so you can build smaller components that then make up bigger components that then make up huge components. And it's pretty cool as well. That last one was mine. Everything else came from the website. Um, so brief expectation setting. This is an introduction to Cycle.js. It's learning how to drive. You can go and do that by yourselves. I wish I knew how to do that, and I wish I could teach you. But for now, we're going to stick with the basics. So to talk about Psycho.js is to talk about the interaction between humans and computers. So the guy who created this framework likes to, likes to think a lot, you know, like, likes to feel a bit philosophical about things. So he talks about human-computer interaction, how Humans and computers communicate in a cycle. And a human's outputs, i.e. clicking on a mouse or something, are the computer's inputs. And then the computer's outputs, displaying something on the screen, playing a sound or something, are the human's input through the senses. So he was thinking about this. And he said, I'm a programmer, right? So I can write this as a couple of functions, one called computer that takes inputs and returns outputs and another human. And the outputs of the computer function go into the human function as inputs and vice versa. So this is quite cool. But those of you who um, look at this for a minute can probably tell that we have like a weird recurrence problem here, right? Like, how can I call a function that needs another function that depends on the first function to run? And that's pretty much what Psycho.js solves. So Psycho.js takes this like architecture of a cycle with um, sources that are inputs into the program, does magic with it, which is what you program, of course. And then it uh, releases syncs, which are the outputs that then get translated using um, drivers into DOM elements, into HTTP requests, or other side effects. So what can I do for you in a nutshell? So Psycho.js is simply an architecture for building reactive web applications, a set of ideas about how to structure an app using RxJS. So it's not something like React or jQuery or Angular that it gives you like a huge tool set and it's a massive library and it has ways of coding. It's more about it's a different way to think about your code and to structure it. 
And to help you out, it provides some very useful libraries. Like I told you about the kind of like recurrence problem before. There's like cycle core, which is like something that you import via um, a node, which solves those problems. But it's mostly a way of thinking about things. So let's have a look at a brief example. So if you go to the site, whoops, it's smaller than I want it to be. Um, so it's this example, right? It's like, it's a box where you can type anything and type like London. And it's hello London. So it's literally like a hello world, hello world on like steroids or something. So that's the cycle program behind it. I want you guys to see what the actual code looks like before I kick off. So at the top, you've got your imports. Um, again, cycle core is the main thing. And then you also import all your DOM elements from um, the cycle DOM driver. Then you've got a function called main that takes in sources and returns sinks. And this is where all the magic happens. It's a pure function. So given one input, one same input, it will always return the same output for that given input. So that makes it very easy to test. Then at the very bottom, we've got the cycle.run function, which is the one that solves the um, recurrency problem. And um, it just connects it to like your actual like app div in your HTML in a similar way to what React does, for example. Um, you write your code to render DOM elements inside the main function. Um, it's similar to JSX in a way that it's a virtual DOM. So it won't actually write HTML code out to your HTML file. It'll just kind of like pretend there exists an element there. And similar to React, it also does like differences. So when something changes, it doesn't re-render everything. It just re-renders the parts that change, which makes it quite um, you know, fast and performant and that kind of thing. So you take in an input as a stream, you map it, and then the variable that goes into your map then gets printed out below. And that's like, kind of like where the cycle happens. I'm going to go over this in more detail later. Don't worry if you don't understand it fully now. I just wanted to show you how the code looks like before we start. Now, functional programming. Scary word for some, beautiful word for others. Who here has done some kind of functional programming before? Oh, OK, great, great, great. So for the benefit of those who haven't done it before or who forgot it a little bit, I'm going to give a very quick example of what functional programming entails, because Cycle is very, very functional. So imagine you've got a robot nanny, and you've got your children, right? That's an array. Andy, Blaine, Charles, ABC. Couldn't think of anything else. And you want the nanny to call them respectfully Master Andy, Master Blaine, Master Charles. And you want to do a program that when you log a variable called family, it'll print that out. So the not so functional way would be using our friend a for loop. So this is like a dumb robot nanny that needs to get told everything. It's like the imperative programming paradigm. You know, It's like, OK, you're a dumb robot. I need to explain how things work, how it works. Let an array called family be empty, then go ahead and count my children and take a counter on one of your hands, and then put a mark every time you run through this. And then for every child, as long as you still have children left in your counter, go again and append master to the beginning, and then add that to the file you created in the beginning. So I mean, it works, but you're telling her how to do every single thing. And the functional way is a smart robot. You trust that she will know how to do it, if you just tell her what you need her to do. So you do not specify how you're going to go about counting it and iterating over it. You just say, I want a constant called family. You're going to take my children. You're going to map them. And for each item in the children array, you're just going to append master to them. So this is the cycle.js way. It's a functional way, right? And the benefit is that it's way more readable. It's less lines, again, makes your code concise. But it's also way easier for other people to understand it, to extend it. And part of the magic of it is that operators like map, you can chain them, right? You can chain many, many, many operators. And that's kind of how the main function in Psycho.js works. So if we go back to the example I showed you before, your, this is an observable, which we're going to look into a bit later. You map it. And then you say start with an empty string, and then you map it again. And all of those operators are functional, right? So it's easy to add another one in between. It's easy to move them around. 
without messing up your code as if you had a for loop, for example. So that's quite cool. Um, plus, again, because we're using pure functions, whenever you have the same input, you're going to get the same output. So not only is it extendable and easy to read, it's also quite testable. Um, so yeah, happy robot. Now, the other big, big paradigm that PsychoJS depends on, even more so than functional programming, is reactive programming. And reactive programming is a term that has been floating around for a few years, but it confuses people sometimes, because like, take React.js, like the, the big framework that Facebook creates that some of us know and love. That's not really reactive programming, but it's called React, so it make it a bit confusing. So reactive programming is something pretty cool. And programming reactively is the main idea, the main architecture behind PsychoJS. So let me give you an example, because it's easier to show than to just tell you about it. So a non-reactive way of building a button that prints hello when you click on it is you have a function that prints hello, you have a button, and the button has an on-click event that says print hello. So who does this? I do this a lot. I'm guessing many of you do, you do this a lot. And it works, because like, you know, print hello is that print hello. But then what happens if, say, you change the name of print hello to be write hello? Well, code breaks, right? Because you need to update your button, because your button no longer knows what print hello is. And not only will it not print anything, it will throw an error and a grumpy cat as well. I mean, you can then change it back to write hello, update it, and it's all fine again. But then what happens if a few months down the line your requirements change or something, and you end up deleting the function? Again, not only will the bot not print hello, because that may be the intent, but it also breaks the code, because it's still there. It's still part of the button. Grumpy cat again. So what's a reactive way of doing this? If we think about a reactive approach to do this, we have the same button, pretty much the same function. But the difference is that the button doesn't really care about the function at all. There's no on-click call. There's no nothing. It doesn't need to know. It's only concerned with the view, with rendering how the button looks like. And what's, according to PsychoJS, that's exactly how programs should be. Things that are concerned with the view should not be concerned with anything else. Because regardless of what you do up here, it's still going to work. And then on the function, we've got an events listener which says, I am going to stay there listening to this particular button. And whenever someone clicks on that button, I'm listening and I know. And when I see that, then I'm going to do some magic and print hello. And if I were to change the name of this to write hello, print hello, write hello, nothing happens. No grumpy cats, because the button doesn't know about this. It still works as long as you call it. Again, if I get rid of the function, yeah, I mean, it won't print anything, of course but it doesn't break the code because the button is separate from the function. So that's the main idea behind reactive programming. It's making your functions react to events that they're listening into rather than making your buttons and your HTTP requests and all other parts of the application call your functions. So you might have seen I wrote Ad Event Listener, which is like an easy JavaScript way of doing things. But it's not the best way of listening to events. So PsychoJS uses a very cool library called RxJS to listen to events. Um, RxJS is, ha, have you guys heard of RxJS before? OK, I, I see a few notes, but mostly confused faces. So basically, a group of very, very smart people got together one day and said, hey, we need to make programming languages more reactive. Because, I mean, there's many program languages out there, but not many of them address the um, reactive programming elements as well as they should. So they got together, they created a library for composing asynchronous and event-based programs using observable sequences. Asynchronous, big scary world, word, so it means just running different things at the same time, which the experience of you may know it's hell, because you know, one thing may depend on another thing, and if it hasn't finished, it may throw an error or do something weird with your code. So they create observables, right, which we're going to go into more detail um, in a minute. But an observable is just like a stream of events 
and each asynchronous stream is an observable, so you listen to them. And again, RxJS is just like one of many Rx libraries for many other like exciting languages like Scala and Python and other slightly more questionable languages like Java and C++. But um, yeah, so it, it's something very cool for dealing with asynchronicity. Um, and again, observables are the, the, it's the core of RxJS and it's also the building blocks of PsychoJS. Everything in PsychoJS is an observable. You think about things as observables because observables are things you can listen to and react. Um, again, they're lazy event streams which can emit one or more events and may or may not finish. So if we draw a line through time, I just drew like green bubbles as events. And that stream of various events at different points in time, that's an observable. And why, like, why even bother with this? Well, main reason is there's simple and very nice operations like we saw before, like maps, like reduce functions, like the sort of thing that you guys familiar with, program, with um, functional programming would do with arrays, for example, with objects or with other collections. Well, RxJS lets you use those um, op operations with the streams, which is it's, it's quite cool. So again, I'm going to give you an example. Let's say you've got a program, and this is like literally a real PsychoJS markup. Um, you've got a checkbox, a blue checkbox, uh, that says off. And when you click on it, it's going to say on. It's a light switch. Yay. So if you go about programming this in PsychoJS, you would start by thinking, OK, my checkbox is going to create a stream of checkbox events. And every time my user clicks on it, it's going to throw either a checked or an unchecked event. So that's this. It's sources.dom is one of the helper things that PsychoJS gives you. It's just a way of targeting DOM elements. I'm going to select inputs which have an event, a change event. So whenever any input changes, it's going to come into this here observable. Then I'm going to run operations with it to create my program. So let's, let's dissect this a bit more. Again, the stream is empty to begin with because nobody's clicked on anything before because the, problem, the program doesn't even exist yet. But the program says, I'm going to listen to all inputs who change. Then. I'm going to map that because I only care about events that are checkboxes, right? So I'm going to map each of these events and I'm going to return whether the target is checked or not because I only care about whether it's checked or not. I want to see a true or false. I don't care about the position of the checkbox in, in the page or anything else. And then I'm going to say I'm going to start with false because if we don't give it an initial value, it's not going to render anything. And then I'm going to map again those events that are either true or false. I'm going to pass them in as toggle. That's like my, the variable name I choose to use. And I'm going to render a div that has the input of type checkbox and a paragraph that's either toggled or not. So because it begins with false, it's not toggled, it will display off. Then user comes in, clicks on the checkbox. What happens? Well, an event comes into your stream. You listen to it. And the map runs. It, it's it's kind of like waiting to run patiently. And when it sees an event come in, it runs. It's checked. It's true now. So let's display on. No event comes in. It's off now. Turns off. And so on. So you just like, it's a program that's just there actively listening to, to events. And when they come, it reacts and prints out DOM elements. So that's, that's the basics of it. It's all about dissecting your program, dissecting your requirements, and saying, hey, how can I think of all of this as events? What can I observe? Oh, I'm going to observe the checkbox. I'm going to observe an HTTP request. I'm going to observe users' inputs. And then it's just about knowing which operations to run with it. And that's, that's pretty much the basics of this. Now, if we have a look at this, which is like what actually renders the thing, guess what? For those of you who know React, it works with JSX as well. So, it's cool, right? So like, I'm very familiar with JSX because I've been working with it for months. So I'm quite familiar with that syntax. That creator decided to go for this as defaults because you know, 
JSX kind of adds like unneeded like tags that look like HTML and stuff. And he said, nah, let's just, let's just get rid of that and make it a bit simpler. But yeah, you're, you're one NPM install away from being able to use JSX. So it's, it's quite cool as well. So, um, so going back to what I said at the beginning, PsychoJS is simply an architecture for building apps. Uh, it's a set of ideas about how you should structure them using RxJS. So again, it says, OK, the guy who invented it said, OK, I really want to program functionally and reactively, but I'm running into many troubles. So I'm going to create a framework that addresses that. And that's pretty much it. So again, the simplicity of it is you say, what can I observe? What do I need to see happen in my DOM or by the user or from the backend to react to? And once you get your list of observables, it's just about chaining two, three, maybe four operations to them, and the magic happens. And all those operations were, again, created by the Rx, um, JS folk. And they're quite powerful. So an average PsychoJS function will probably only need two, three, maybe four operations chained together, rather than like having a massive list of hundreds of like for loops and if conditions and stuff like that. So it makes it quite simple in the end. So let's now move into the good, the bad, and the beautiful of using PsychoJS, in my opinion, of course. So let's start with the good, because, you know, positive note. It's very easily testable. As I've said before, it's pure function. So there's nothing that you can test more easily than a pure function. Like, I've literally, literally broken my head so many times before in my projects trying to test a React component where I'm trying to mock it, render it into the virtual DOM, and then see if I can mock a click event and observe for a class name change or something. Here it's just, okay, it's all pure function. So if I put this in, I expect to get this out. Does it work or does it not work? So for those of you who like to do test-driven developments, quite cool. It's very lightweight. So again, because it's more of a set of ideas rather than a huge library. Cycle core, which is the one that gets rid of the little circularity problem, that's pretty much the only thing you need other than the driver. Cycle core is about 100 lines long. Like, if you compare that with massive libraries like perhaps React, Angular, or even like jQuery and those like things of the past, it, it's cutting down your load time, right? When, I, when a user loads the page, it, it's going to be way faster. And also, when they click on something, because it doesn't need to go through a massive library, it all just functions a bit better. And it's also way, way less intrusive than having to deal with a completely different system or set of functions that come from the library, because you're not inheriting much. You can still write pretty much vanilla JS, just like hype it up to the next level. Um, it's compostable, which is a word that my um, software wasn't really happy about. It gave me a red squiggly line. But it, it basically means you can create components out of it. Like everything in PsychoJS is a component. Even your whole app is a component. And you can put your whole app inside a bigger app, and it'll work. Because again, it's all pure functions. It's all pure functions. So you can nest them together. You can nest many components inside a bigger one. And then if you want to create a page where you display all of your apps, you can do it as well. So it's quite cool. And keeps your code short as well. You know, like you want your components to be small. You don't want a file that's going to be over 200 lines of code or anything. You want to keep many separate components to make it sensible. And something I didn't really have the time to go over today, but it's worth a look, is the recommended kind of like architecture for PsychoJS is called MVI. So it's similar to MVC for those of you who know MVC from like object-oriented programming. Um, it's just called model view intent. And it's just a very nice way that's very simple to use in PsychoJS of separating your view concerns, your model concerns, and your intents. So each of those will be a set of pure functions again that are very easy to think about, very easy to understand, and very easy to put together into an application. So what am I not telling you? What haven't I told you that the bad things? So it's not, I don't really see them as like uber like bad things about PsychoJS. It's more like drawbacks, you know? It's like 
paradigm shift, for example, because you need to think about programs reactively. Probably the most difficult thing to adopt PsychoJS is it, there's no funky syntax you need to learn or anything. It's just about kind of like rewiring your brain to think of things reactively. Think about observables rather than trying to like put a function inside a bottle as we all, all, all do sometimes. But that's not, I mean, obviously it's a different architecture. It's not really a drawback of PsychoJS, but it's definitely a hurdle you need to jump before you start with it. There's a smallish community. I mean, when you compare it with the likes of React and Angular, it's obviously going to be way smaller than that. Like pretty much all like respectable JavaScript people today, I think, have at least heard of React and Angular and they haven't heard of Psycho yet, not all of them. But again, let's make it bigger, you know? The only way that community is going to grow, the only way we're going to address this drawback is by, you know, actively making the community bigger. And it's worth saying as well, even though it is not a huge community, it is a very active one. So I'm going to tell you about this um, a bit later as well. But like, um, and again, it's, it's not a huge name, so like there may not yet be any like a lot of tailored NPM install packages, for example. There are quite a few and there are enough to get you started, but you won't find the same number as you would for a larger library. But again, as the community gets bigger, as people like you guys start hearing about it, start using it, it's all going to get bigger, right? So it's, it's, it's like, a, a, like a cycle, really. <laughs> like the bigger the community gets, the better the situation gets, so the bigger the community gets again. And just to finish up with a few beautiful points, it's like that code you write, it's, it's, it's quite sexy, right? It's, it's clean, it's succinct. Again, the aim is for you to not write any unnecessary words whatsoever, like at the core. So it's quite cool. Again, smaller pages, shorter load times, more performant applications, and it's pretty powerful. So yeah, that's pretty much it. So again, going back to expectation setting, Hopefully, you have enough to start to write now. Now it's just up to you to take it to the next level. And to do that, I'm just going to leave that up for a few minutes while I answer questions. They're just like a curated list of very nice things where you can get more resources. Main page inside, tons of links. The ReactiveX page, that's quite good as well. That's like people who created RxJS. And that one is it's, it's a Git project, and it literally the tagline is a collection of all some PsychoJS tools, resources, and shiny things. So, tons of links in there to examples, to libraries, to packages. And got an hour and 37 minutes. There's a very good course that the creator made to teach you how to use it. So, gonna leave that up there. And other than that, thank you very much. I hope you enjoy this. I hope I've inspired you to at least give it a try. And I will take all questions now.